Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Neta Polemi from uh, uh, DigiConnect, uh, Unit H1 on cybersecurity and uh, uh, technologies. Uh, I would like very much to thank you for attending this uh, Connect University summer school session on uh, an overview of supply chain security. I will moderate uh, the session uh, and we have the uh, three uh, honored uh, panelists and speakers. Uh, Mr. Will Van uh, Hiswick <coughs> from uh, Customs uh, Directorate. Um, we have Ahmed Duza from uh, Maggioli uh, Group and uh, Mr. Stefan Schauer from the Austrian Institute of Technology. Uh, thank you very much from uh, people, colleagues from uh, Brussels and uh, the colleagues from Luxembourg. And we will start our session by giving some introductory uh, concepts and an introductory presentation on uh, supply chain security, because after all, this is a summer school, so we need some uh, basic uh, teaching material. So I will do the first presentation. And we well, I always like to start my presentation can you hear me? No? Hello? Yes, okay. From Luxembourg, we can hear you. You can hear me? Wonderful. And people from, uh, colleagues from Luxembourg, everything is fine. Okay, wonderful. We can hear you, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, I always like to start my basic uh, uh, presentation and uh, with introductory with introductory concepts and the first uh, concept is what we mean by an information system we know that whether we are critical infrastructure like the airport the railway or the hospital or the banks they host information systems but what is an information system by an information system we mean a consecutive layers of physical and cyber assets that they are interdependent. We have six layers. The first layer, which is the physical layer that includes uh, the infrastructural part, buildings, terminals, gates, and so on. On top, we have the telecom layer that we have the uh, all type of networks, ad hoc networks, internet, Wi-Fi, satellite, and the equipment, satellite, uh, um, uh, the, uh, optical fibers, uh, telecom devices, routers, and so on. Next, we have the IT equipment and software layer that uh, the assets there are ICT assets, like software, um, data sources, like surveillance systems, uh, cameras, um, all IOTs that uh, we use these days, and also, of course, servers and uh, Next, we have the electronic and uh, mobile services that are built using the previous uh, layers and the previous assets. And by electronic and, and of course, mobile services, we mean e-banking, electronic procurement, e invoicing, uh, electronic ordering, mobile ordering, and so on. And of course, to utilize services, we, we need data. So the next layer is data, the layer with data. And we have big data, proprietary data, stream data, and so on. And finally, the last sixth layer are the users. And by users, we mean people, physical persons, and also objects. And also have processes, security processes that we use. So this stack of layers uh, is what we mean an information system that can be hosted in an individual enterprise in, uh, or in a distributed manner. So what we, we need now, we want to secure all assets, whether they are the cyber assets between second and, and uh, fifth layer, or the physical assets which are included in the first and the sixth layer. And what do we want? We want to secure all assets in these layers, and by security we mean the, the following uh, dimensions. We want to ensure confidentiality, Integrity, authenticity, availability, and non-repudiation, according to the definition provided by the ISO 27001 standard. 
So this is our goal, to, in, in, to ensure that th those dimensions are addressed in all layers of our information system. And of course, all assets uh, can address various threats. For example, the physical assets, uh, the, the infrastructure, well, we have threats like uh, uh, earthquakes, storms, but also the cyber assets uh, may, uh, may face various threats like non-authorized non, um, non access. Um, we can have uh, malware, uh, various attacks uh, that uh, um, address the, 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 the network layer and so on, denial of service attacks. Threats will always be there. The question is, how ready we are to address these threats? Do we have any weaknesses? And that's what we call vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities are synonymous of weaknesses. And weaknesses of, what does it mean? We have missing controls to secure our assets from these threats. So what do we want to see? Want to, what we would like to uh, ask the enterprises is to perform their risk assessment. What do we mean by that? They need to evaluate the threat level, the threats that all assets may face, the level of, of these threats, that means how often these threats occur, the vulnerability level of these threats of the specific asset, and their vulnerability level depends upon the controls they have undertaken. The more controls you have undertaken to secure the, your assets, the level of vulnerability to the threats is, is lower. Also, we need to evaluate the impact in case that this threat, in case that the vulnerability gets exploited, what is the impact that will be in your organization? So the impact of the vulnerability in case, in case becomes exploited needs to be evaluated. And these three factors, the threat level, the vulnerability level, and the impact level gives us the risk level of this threat to specific asset. So the organizations need to perform their risk assessment, evaluate all the risks that exist for, specific, for the specific threats for all their assets in all layers of the information system. That's what we call risk assessment. And after we perform the risk assessment and we know the risk levels, we need to manage those risks. We need to add controls, probably. And the more controls we add, the, we lower the risk level. And that's what we call risk management. Of course, we have various standards to perform risk assessment and risk management. And the most uh, uh, common one is the ISO 27001 and 005. And you have methodologies that actually implement those standards. And ESA has a very nice repository of all methodologies that the enterprises can use based on the standards. And also have various directives, like the NIS directive. Uh, actually, the NIS directive is the basic for securing critical infrastructures, uh, asking the critical infrastructure operators to perform their risk assessment and also to manage their risk. In um, the, also, we have many research projects from uh, Framework Program 7 and from Horizon 2020, we have NCEF projects. We have projects that we ha the Commission has funded in order to uh, uh, develop innovative, dynamic risk assessment methodologies so all enterprises, hospitals, banks can use. The question is, though, do the enterprises have isolated formation system providing isolated services? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Things are much more complex in our dig digital ecosystem. All enterprises, whether they are hospitals or banks or um, uh, critical infrastructures, they provide complex services invo involving many entities outside of the organization. We have interdependencies of organizations in order to provide a specific service. And I will give an example. The, the vehicle transport service, 
let's say Volkswagen wants to uh, deliver cars from uh, Germany to Greece. This is a typical supply chain service that actually involves the company, Volkswagen, imp uh, import companies, uh, critical infrastructures because they need to move the cars, uh, transportation companies, ministries of transport, and so on. All these entities, they, uh, they interdepend and they have connections, either physical or cyber connections, by sending electronic invoicing, electronic ordering, through emails and so on. So in order to provide and, and this service, they need to collaborate and, uh, the, and this, uh, the provision of the service depends upon the successful and secure uh, interdependencies. That's what we call supply chain service. And by uh, the ISO 2800 definition, by supply chain, we mean the linked set of resources and processes that upon placement of a purchase order begin with the sourcing of raw material and extends through the manufacturing, processing, handling, and delivering of goods. The question is, uh, do we have threats? Of course we have threats that we call supply chain threats. We don't have only individual threats, as I mentioned before, but the whole supply chain, this, this uh, web of cyber and physical assets that are interconnected, they face different uh, uh, threats. For example, unauthorized access. Um, malicious code insertion, information tampering. And if that occurs, the impact is not to the individual organization, but to the supply chain, to the supply chain provision. And this is the most, uh, the impact is not on the individual enterprise, but on all enterprises involved in the supply chain. And of course, the impact is uh, we have catastrophic uh, uh, economic loss, probably loss of life even. So the impact of um, uh, a vulnerability in a supply chain has much, is more catastrophic that, than the ones from the individual enterprises. So we need to see then uh, the a supply chain uh, as as a, you know, as a graph of nodes that are interconnected, that hackers actually really monitor to see what type of um, hacking is more efficient, malicious uh, code insertion, uh, and so on. So the partners involved in the supply chain, these business partners, actually they need together to realize that they need to, to secure their supply chain by performing a supply chain risk assessment to manage the supply chain risks together and share the information required in order to address any incident that occurs in the supply chain. So information sharing is mandatory in the security of a supply chain service. Now, we have various sources that you can find the various threats that uh, uh, the supply chain uh, face. We have an ESA report uh, uh, from Europol and so on. So it's very nice material. We have standards, actually, that we can use for supply chain security. The ISO 2800 series of standards is very common to the ISO 27001 and 005. But instead of using the word threat, they use the word supply chain threat, meaning that the impact is more broader. So we can use those uh, standards to perform our risk assessment. And NISA had uh, published a very nice report in 2015 called Supply Chain Integrity, mentioning all these problems. And we have the NIST uh, report on uh, supply chain. So, and also have many projects in Horizon 2020 that deal, that deal with uh, supply chain, physical and cyber security. To mention just a few, it was CIS, Medicaid, Saron, uh, and so on. Many projects on supply chain security that provide the, the evidence into the policymakers for, for uh, further actions on supply chain uh, security. European Union has the right instruments 
and has set the fundamentals for, for securing the critical infrastructures and the operators of uh, critical services, as the supply chain services. The NIS directive, GDPR, but we need to assess all these instruments in order to ensure that the wording is correct. So supply chain threat and supply chain risk assessment need to be embedded in the existing instruments that we have, the policy instruments. Also have the CSAT network that collects uh, incidents from uh, the national search and the local search. But we need to consider that the CSAT network need to also collect somehow to find a mechanism to collect supply chain incidents. We have the Certification Act, a very important uh, um, new directive for certification. Probably one day we can certify services, supply chain services, and we can perform uh, uh, risk assessment to the supply chain and conformity assessment. So the instruments and the, the instruments are there. We just need to modify some wordings, I guess. So. I will stop here my introductory presentation and I would uh, like to uh, invite the speakers that the objectives of this session today is to identify the policy, technological, scientific, business and operational challenges on supply chain security and our experts to propose uh, some, uh, uh, what is the way forward. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions. So I'm going back to my new, to the role of moderator, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Will Van Hiswick, uh, that he comes from the Customs uh, Directorate. He is a chairperson of the U U EU Customs Detection Technology Project Group. Uh, he is a Customs Policy Advisor to the European Union Horizon 2020 Security Research Program, and the EU representative of the World customs organization, technical expert group on non-intrusive inspection equipment. The presentation is entitled Customs Supervision and Security in Global Supply Chain. Thank you very much and the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good morning everybody. Good morning also to colleagues in Luxembourg. Um, it's a bit of, um, we are entering into the uh, holiday season and I think many of you will start to travel around and you might come across uh, a custom officer uh, when going, leaving the European Union or maybe you come back. But these people are not only interested in uh, what are people are carrying uh, around, there is, there is much more. And in this um, talk, which I'm going to give you, I will zoom in a bit on what are the customs competences what is customs doing uh, to protect the European um, uh, Union and its citizens? And I will zoom in a bit more on the physical aspects of securing supply chains and our external borders, as I would expect that my co-panelists would go a bit more in the technical and, the, and, and the, the digital aspects of it. I will touch upon a bit, but it's a bit more on where our, where our competences uh, are. So what I will um, talk to you about is a bit, I will um, divide my, my talk a bit in, in, in three parts. I will say a bit about the, strat the strategy, the objectives and the policy instruments which we have to implement our, our policy and our competences. The role of, I should better say, the increasing role of the use of technology in supply chain supervision. And I will uh, end with um, saying a few words about new emerging technologies and challenges which that will um, pose for um, um, uh, the customs community within the European Union. So let me first say a bit a bit about our um, strategy that we uh, that we have. You know, customs is always they are very much interested and they live and they love data. So there is a tsunami uh, of data which is, becomes more and more available, which will provide it to customs. Of course, we cannot check everything, we cannot control everything. To give you an idea, last year, 2017, we had more than, it's about 350 million customs declarations, which need to be checked 
by we have in total um, about 115,000 custom officers in all our 28 member states. So if you would there do a bit of a quick calculation, it means that every second eight customs declarations have to be cleared. So that means that somewhere within the European Union, every second eight people have to push a button that this goods can go uh, can go on. And you might have, I would expect that you have also experiences in ordering goods outside the European Union. Maybe you deal with with, with Alibaba in China or other uh, um, uh, suppliers in in the world. And that means that part of your data is at a certain moment, and I will say a bit more about that later on, when it comes to Europe, somebody from a customs organization somewhere in the European Union will look at that and probably decide whether this has to be selected of being high risk or whether this needs to be, needs to be controlled. So we are looking for systems and technologies that can support us to develop a systematic sharing of risk-oriented information. And we have to do that in a way that we have efficient measures to stop illicit, restricted, and prohibited goods. Of course, we cannot do that alone. There's also um, economic operators uh, working in, uh, in doing business, doing trade, using supply chains. So they are partners. We have to work with them. Customs is not only any more interested than just the traditional tax uh, uh, issues, um, VAT, import duties, excise, things like that. Because since the terrorist attacks we, um, um, that occurred after um, uh, 2001 in the US and also terrorist attacks we had in, uh, in, in London and in Madrid, there's a number of security-related tasks have been attributed to the customs administrations. And they are really now a service provider for supply chain security. It's our competence, the competence of uh, European Customs Administrations, to secure external borders and to oversee and to monitor global supply chains. So in this way, we, as DG TechSuit, together with the member states, we contribute on a daily basis, 24 hours uh, per day, to the security of the European Union but it's also our task to facilitate legitimate trade and to also to promote European competitiveness. So customs should not unnecessarily interfere in the flow of goods. So we need to have good reasons if we want to control something and how we are going to do that. So we can say that customs is really in the front line now um, in the fight against fraud, terrorism and organized crime. These are things of which, on a daily basis, they might be pops up in supply chains. Because it's not a secret that supply chains which exist are used, they are vulnerable to be used by criminal organizations to get goods across within, uh, get into the European Union or even export from them. So these are the, um, the top 10 categories of goods that we don't want to have in our supply chains. And when I speak about supply chains, it means it can be every uh, transport mode. It can be by car, it can be by bus, it can be by rail, airplane, ships, um, uh, post. Uh, so there's, that's the, the definition for us of the supply chain uh, covers all modes of transport. And we have to have systems in place where we can prevent and we can detect and intercept and stop these types of, of threats, of threat material. And you can see it's very, it's very vast, and this can also differ. These threats are not always on the same place, on the same time. They can differ. They can differ from country to country, from region to region, and they also can be pops up more, um, uh, uh, more often, less because criminals, they will see which kind of material they can make the best profit of, and they are easily can uh, shift to what kind of material they want to get uh, into the, the European Union. So our main policy objectives is, is to enhance security in the supply chain, and at the same time, we have also to facilitate trade. It feels a bit here, there can be a bit of friction there, because if I put more emphasis on security, the effect might be that I will do more controls, more in-depth controls, and I'm going to slow down the flow of goods, the trade, or the economic aspect. 
which there we have to find a balance. And in order to do that, we have three legal instruments based in our legislation, and our main legislation is the Union Customs Code, which is from uh, um, um, 2013, where we, we have three key instruments at our disposal. is the risk management um, strategy and action plan, our authorized economic operator, so that our the good behaviors, our trusted um, economic parties, partners, and uh, um, the use of state-of-the-art of detection equipment and other innovative technologies. And I will go uh, through these um, uh, more in detail. So, as I said, customs loves and lives by the creation of data. So, data is the first um, the first moment that customs will get an information that the goods are going to be to be moved. And we have, when we are dealing with this data, we have to make sure that um, uh, that the data is treated secure, it's reliable. We have to facilitate the business process, and we have also to use this risk management to do an, an efficient controls. Let me give you an example. If a um, ship, now you have um, big container vessels, they can uh, reach up to more than uh, 18,000 containers on a vessel, which are now also the next generation will go over the 20,000 maybe. But let's say, i give you an example. If a container, is a ship, a container vessel is going from China to a port in, uh, in, Rot in, in the Netherlands, for example, say Rotterdam, then 24 hours before that ship is going to start its voyage at the other side of the, um, of, of the waters, they have to provide already a first set of data electronically to customs. So customs will receive summary declarations. It's not very rich data, but it's the first data of all the goods which are on that vessel. And if those containers are destined for any country within the European Union, the first point of entry, as I said, in this case, it will be Rotterdam. They have to do a first risk analysis. So they are going to check, okay, who are the people, where is this coming from, um, uh, what are the type of goods, is there any risk. This is done uh, mostly in an electronic and in an automated uh, way. And we have also, we have the possibility to also to say, okay, this container, we contains of too high risk, and please do not load it. So it has to go off the ship and it cannot start its voyage. If the risk is not of that high security, but there are still doubts, then we will ask for subsequent data during the voyage, because such a container is for an average four to five weeks on the sea, and we will enrich the information, the intelligence we have, and we make decisions upon our control in the future. That's a bit of, an, of, an, of how the system is, is working. With our risk management policy, we have a number of strategic areas and orientations. Of course, for us, it's always important to have the best data, the best quality. It's, uh, and there, we, um, I have to be honest with you, the data we receive is not always of best and accurate um, uh, quality. So there we have systems in place in our um, newly risk management strategy and action plan to improve this. So we will come up with legal requirements in the future that we um, impose to economic operators, so in this case when, when it's a container ship for the carriers, or even sometimes the importers, to provide us with better data so we can do our risk, um, um, our risk assessment. We have also to work a bit better on risk mitigations, so we can see when there are risks identified, where are we going to do that control, which is most convenient, which is most convenient also in the flow of the process, because that are aspects we need to take into consideration. This is, of course, also not something that customs authorities and DG Tech Suit can do alone. This, so this requires an extensive negotiations, information with other DGs, like colleagues in DG Move, in DG Home, in DG Sanko. Uh, there are more DG Trade to, um, to get an alignment of, of our policies and needs. Uh, and we, of course, we see also with our other nations, like with the US, with China and Japan, for example, to get more of an international cooperation. The second component after the risk management is the 
authorized economic operator concept, which we have introduced since 2008. And this is a sort of, uh, it's not fully equivalent, but is a sort of um, uh, uh, certification concept where we um, uh, give a certificate of compliance to, to parties who work in, who have a role to play in any supply chain. So normally these are companies or entities who are involved in cross-border international movements of goods. And if they fulfill a number of requirements and they are really severe, they can be certified as AO, which means that for us they are a trusted partner. So the company and also the, the, uh, the responsible persons in the company, they have to sign up uh, that they um, uh, really ensure that they have all the things in place in order to be, uh, to be, to be certified. Um, this, uh, and that means that they, are, we, they will be checked. If a company wants to get an AO certificate, they have to do first do a self-assessment. Uh, whether they, it's, it's a bit like when you start to prepare for an, an, an ISO um, uh, certification. Then afterwards, um, they will be brought in contact with the customs administration where the company is, um, is um, uh, has, uh, in the country where they, uh, uh, where they are. And then further controls will be, will be done. This requires also an in-depth analysis of, of, of the bookkeeping, of the, um, uh, the, uh, the financial solvency, how they do the vetting of the personnel, how is the security with whom they are working. And at the end, they might be, get a, um, uh, a certificate. So this program, as I said, was operational since uh, um, 2008. Last year we celebrated the uh, 10th anniversary and we have now more or less uh, 21,600 um, authorized economic operators within the European Union. If a company is certified, they get a number of benefits. And the ben the, some of the benefits is, is that they get notified in case they will be selected for a control and then they have the option to say, okay, I want to have the control happen at the moment my goods arrive within the European Union or I would like to have the control at the final destination. So where the container in this case, in, in, for example, would be unpacked. They have also, they get a lower score for, for the risk analysis, the risk assessment. So they will have fewer physical controls. Um, however, I have to say, it's not a free ticket. Also, they are subject from time to time to controls. So it's not um, um, uh, a blank card that, they, that they, they can do whatever they want. No, there will be, there will be, um, uh, there will be some controls for them. So once an AEO certificate is recognized, it's immediately valid, um, valid in all our 28 member states. The, such a certificate is, um, uh, has an unlimited um, uh, validity, but from time to time we do cross-checks uh, in our member states to see whether a company, an entity, is still complying with the rules. And in case there are infringements or there are legal procedures, such certificates can also be suspended in case investigations are ongoing or they can also be revoked. This does not happen so often but it, it happens, uh, it's part of also of the, um, of the, legal, the legal system. Of course, this is something where we also work together with other commission services because they might have also in the security part, they have similar certification um, programs or, or um, uh, products and we try to align with them. So um, colleagues in our team, they have um, uh, frequent discussions with colleagues in, in DG Mare, uh, in, in DG um, uh, Maria for the maritime and for the uh, aviation, but also with the colleagues in DG Agri, and DG Sante, uh, related to, to product, product safety, but also in DG Trade when it comes, for example, to export of dual use of strategic good items. Of course, supply chains are by nature internationally, globally, if you, if you want. So this is also something that we try to 
um, um, have our programs mutual recognized with other trading trading blocks. So we have um, uh, mutual recognition programs in place with um, the US, with China, with um, Japan, with Switzerland, and we are currently negotiating with Hong Kong and um, uh, Canada. And the reason is that with this, when we do mutually recognize these programs, we make the supply chains and the supply chain supervision, we make it longer because it starts already at the end of the, uh, at the start, where it starts at the uh, um, far away from, from the European Union. So the third component, which we have to enhance um, in supply chain supervision, so after the risk management and the trusted trader program, is that, of course, at a certain moment, based on risk analysis or risk selection, customs might take a decision to control um, a consignment, a shipment of goods. Um, so this is the last and, and uh, a very important um, element in our um, control process. Of course, it's not why one, do we want to do that control, eh? because sometimes we, if we use, for example, an X-ray, we get an image. If we get a spectroscopic uh, analysis equipment, we, uh, we, we get a spectra we need to analyze. If we do a full control, somebody has to count the boxes and then we get a number. But the main reason for is why we want to make use of any kind of detection technology is that the custom officers who are in the field, they have a very, very limited time frame to make a decision whether this is, is there a risk or not, or do I need to retain these goods for, um, uh, for further inspection? In simple terms, is it red or green? And technology can tremendously help them to facilitate that kind of decision making. Of course, when we make use of these kind of technologies and equipment, there are challenges. There are constantly new and emerging threats. Because they um, try to, to give you an example, um, years ago it was very fashion to make um, double-sided um, uh, container walls, hidden, hidden compartments. With an X-ray, of course, this is quite easily uh, um, uh, to detect if you know where to look for. And the technology there is also improving, so it gives them a good image. So what they then will do, of course, is they will try to conceal the goods, to pack the goods with... Um, um, which have more or less the same organic composition. And then if somebody then would need to look at an image, it's much more difficult to see. If you would, for example, pack cocaine in, um, uh, um, uh, together with um, um, uh, frozen pizzas or frozen fish, you have a bit of a more homogeneous composition and then it's more difficult to detect any anomalies. The funding of that equipment, of course, is very expensive. Budgets are under constantly stress and under um, cuts by um, uh, the member states. So that, that is a challenge. For this, the Commission has now drafted a new proposal to come up with a very robust um, co-funding mechanism to fund um, um, equipment. The proposed envelope for that is 1.3 billion. But the negotiations are ongoing under the next MFF, the multi-financial framework, so we have to see how this goes. But the, the, the regulation as such is prepared. We wait whether we can get it um, um, uh, through uh, and approved by, <coughs> by the co-legislators. Working with technologies, it has also certain limitations and you need also to know how to use it. And one of the problems which we see now more and more upcoming is that, let's say, the traditional um, recruited custom officers, they are not that uh, technically skilled, uh, uh, but also with all the new means that will come up. So that is a challenge we will have to look into, and, but I will come back to that later. It was mentioned by Nina, I'm also the chair of the Customs Detection Technology Project Group, that is a group of experts of member states who, <coughs> on a regular basis, normally two to three times a year, comes together, and then we discuss what is going on around us, what are the new trends, what products are coming into the market, what is commercially available, what would work for us, what not. We provide them, we help them in, to draft technical specifications, tender procedures, and we are also very active in the um, Horizon 2020 security research program, where we have topics on the agenda which uh, are expected to deliver 
uh, some results to facilitate our work. And overall, there's, I saw there's a small typo in the slide because this is only one, one slide I am prepared for this, for this topic. In our role, vision, and where we want to go is that we want to come in the future to 100% validated supervision of global supply chains. And that means that we have to come to uh, the highest degree as possible of outdoor detection in data and goods. For innovation in data, I mean everything what has to do with data analytical instruments. There, which it will be crucial for us that there is already filters are prepared, they are made, which can guide us and, and will help us to filter already the massive amount of data that is already available and even eh, with blockchain uh, um, uh, becoming more and more um, uh, prominent, also used in, uh, in, in supply chains. So there will be more data available, but this has to be validated. It has to come from someone that we know that we can trust and, and validate, say, the authenticity of the data and the person who is responsible for providing the data and to make their selection and to help us to steer to make the right um, uh, selections. Of course, there's also a, a lot of new emerging technologies who are popping up and we have to, um, um, uh, to update them in, uh, in, in the approaches and they can support our um, business concept for the, for the future. So we really see what we are looking for is that we come to an integrated use of innovative uh, uh, technologies, um, making all kinds, linking different sources of information. It can be open source, it can be intelligence, it can be, it can be restricted, but they have to be all channeled and to, to tunneled into something that we can use as a robust um, uh, uh, decision-making system. Of course, we are not blind and we see what is happening, what is working um, around this. And the technologies I have set up here that are currently, um, uh, let's say, modern technologies, which will have an impact on the future way of working and how customs is doing business. Uh, blockchain, there are already uh, um, um, Big entities um, uh, like Maersk and ABM, they have already set up a, a so-called straight lens platform where they provide um, um, data in uh, um, uh, supply chain data, um, which will also be linked to, to customs. Artificial intelligence is popping up more and more to develop algorithms, which we can use to train our people, but also the equipment we have to teach the equipment. So. The equipment Customs is now using, for example, an X-ray. The X-ray is already, at this moment, is intelligent enough to capture data saying, okay, the Customs Declaration says that this is a container of bananas. Bananas have this shape, they have this pattern, this is recognized in the system. If there is something which is not according to that um, uh, um, uh, algorithm they have, it will tell them, listen, here's something wrong, and you have to look into it. This goes very fast. This are developing. Internet of Things, everything I think you all here in the room maybe might know much more about this than, um, than, than I do. But we see that there will be uh, the interconnectivity uh, that, is, that brings a lot of positive things, but it, it, it makes you also vulnerable. Uh, virtual, rea virtual reality, something we will look into to further for training purposes. Drones. So drones, always we have a bit of a, a double feeling because drones can be our friend, for example, for large um, um, area surveillances of border crossings in rough terrains or something or, um, uh, or blue borders. Uh, they can help us to, uh, um, uh, to do a lot of surveillance. But on the other hand, drones are also now more and more used to get contraband across borders. There are drones and swarms of drones flying around with, for example, contraband with cigarettes, smaller amounts of drugs, and they go on a constantly basis, they go across borders. That are not huge quantities, but if you can do that with multiple drones and you can do that many hours a day, it ends up at the end and that becomes a problem. 3D printing is also something where we have to be very careful for two reasons. It's, it's, 
goods now maybe physically eh, they are not um, uh, be uh, sent from one region to the other. It's just a file will be sent and then the goods will be printed somewhere else. Eh? How is customs going to deal with this? Or we have also already seen that, for example, that it is already possible to um, uh, print um, uh, working firearms. Eh? They are fully 3D printed and they are working. That is, of course, a problem to, uh, uh, to intercept that and to protect for that. When we start working on how we want to design a bit on our smart board, where we want to look into, we come up, and this is also linked together with a new strategy developed by the World Customs Organization, uh, which is an organization of around 150 uh, uh, customs organizations, is the smart border principle, which stands for secure, measurable, automated, risk management based and technology driven. Secure, I think that's that speaks for for it. Measurable, we want to know how how um, uh, how can we measure the effectiveness of the data we get. How can we see how effective we are and measure in implementing um, uh, the systems we have? Higher degree of automation. This is very very crucial. We cannot do everything uh, uh, on ourselves anymore. Uh, this has to be uh, automated. It still is risk based. And, and uh, based on risk management, because that's the way how we how we work, and this has to be, of course, also technology driven. And so there has the technology uh, has to be there um, uh, behind to support our future way of working. Of course, and this here, I would like to to leave this a bit of of sort of challenges which which are relevant to um, uh, to us. Um, Managing the current and future threat scenarios to be automated and integrated. This is a challenge for us because we have to see uh, how um, um, how can this be 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 integrated. How would this how would this how would this work? So this is in in an automated in an automated way. Where where would it fit? So this is this is important to us, and this also becomes together also the link where maybe. Um, uh, Let's say uh, artificial decision making will be combined with the uh, uh, the human the human decision making. The human factor is very very um, relevant for for us is because it's um, uh, the technology developments they are currently going so fast. So we are also uh, sometimes a bit worried, and we have to see whether. Is our are our organizations are we ready to cope with all these technologies? Is the staff ready to um, grasp all the benefits of all these technologies? So that means that we have to look into um, uh, and to revisit together with the member states what would be the future policy of recruiting staff, because you have to recruit people with a higher degree, uh, younger generation also, which are able to cope with all these new these new. These new, uh, these new challenges. That's something, and this also then will have to be embedded into a very robust new style training program. The other thing is that we have to also to um, uh, raise, uh, to start awareness raising uh, campaigns uh, at, at the same time. Of course, ethical uh, and social to impact of, of new technologies. That's also something where we have to look into. Is it for law enforcement authorities do they simply have to accept everything which comes available, commercially available? Or are we, do we have to be a bit more selective into, uh, into this? Who will govern new technologies? Uh, is it the technology by itself? Or, or is it the people? Uh, what will take the overhand? Uh, will it be the, 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 the machine decision making? Is it the, the, the persons? Um, that, that are things which are relevant for us and where we would like to um, uh, to work um, uh, much more further on, which are challenges for us. And for us, we have no time to sit back and to relax, and we have to act together. And that's my final um, uh, slide. I hope I give you a bit of a snapshot. It was uh, I could zoom in on many of these aspects much more longer, but I want to give you a bit of a, a bit of a feeling and things what we are doing together with our member states, to trying to make Europe a secure and better place. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, let me take some questions from starting with the colleagues from Luxembourg. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, I have two questions, really. So the first one has to do with the uh, artificial intelligence aspect of what you described. So. Uh, the G-Connect is currently in the process of making its plans for funding programs in artificial intelligence in the next commission. So to what extent do your requirements uh, flow into the process? So you told me that there is 1.3 billion euros that customs uh, expect to spend, I don't know exactly under what period, over in order to enhance uh, their artificial intelligence detection capabilities, uh, that seems to be a lot of money that could go into making the, the type of systems that you need uh, more effective. That was the first question. Let me ask the second one uh, as well so that you can answer them together. So the second question has to do with what economists uh, call mechanism design. So how do you set up a system of incentives so as to maximize the chances that all the actors in the system act uh, as uh, they are expected to. So with respect uh, to the blockchain developments that you described, an important aspect uh, of blockchain technology is that it allows you to implement uh, in a non-repudiable way what are called smart contracts. So you could imagine a custom situation where I, a shipper in China, put a certain amount of money on escrow on a blockchain, so this money is now out of my hands, with the understanding that if any customs authority at the receiving end finds that what I'm shipping is not what I said I would be shipping, the money is immediately forfeited. And so that, you see, creates a very powerful incentive not to declare that you're shipping what you're not shipping. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's not just a matter to determine ex post if what is uh, explained to be part of a shipment is in fact what it is, mm -hmm. but you can create an ex-ante incentive to make it extremely risky and expensive not to comply. So those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you for um, the questions. The first one, um, the program the program I was referring to, uh, which um, the program is called the Customs Control Equipment Instrument, it will have a run for seven years. So it's in line with the next MFF. So from 2021 until 2027, under still the condition that this is um, uh, adopted by the co-legislators and that also the envelope will not, will not change. Uh, the syst this fund is um, intended really to finance, to co-finance, I say, because the co-finance is up to 80%, 8-0. So it's still that the member states have to fund the 20% plus the VAT. Um, so, yeah, you can say it's, it's a lot of money. I agree with you. But for a seven years program, 28 member states, uh, uh, then maybe at the end it's, uh, we have to see how, the, how this works. Um, that is the, the to, with regards to the envelope. Then artificial intelligence is something which is uh, which will be embedded into this because we want to have the technology make them more 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 um, uh, more workable. And so we want uh, we have already now some research projects ongoing under Horizon 2020, which are looking a bit into these aspects. So this is certainly something which comes up and where we have to see what, how this can be done in, in, um, in, in a better way. And this is also something where we would also certainly on at the European level, we have to consider because the people who are developing these algorithms for um, uh, to have um, uh, to apply art of artificial intelligence, they need a lot of information, they need a lot of data. Member states are a bit reluctant to share this data, but we will have to find a way to get them across and to open up and to able to provide them. 
So that's something which needs to um, which needs to to happen, which will be relevant in this in this case. So this certainly is an area where we have to look into altogether, and where we need to uh, where's a lot of work still to be to be done. For us, the use of artificial intelligence is uh, is something new. Uh, so we are developing ourselves and 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 finding out how the best ways to do it. So um, um, that is the, that is the current situation. The other thing is that what you said to um, uh, blockchain is within the the supply chain you have you have different parties who are providing data it can be a shipper it can be the carrier it can be the um, uh, the importer um, for customs of course it's important the one who lodge the declaration eh? who that's the person who is responsible and that's also the person where we can take eventually legal um, uh, uh, measures in case there is uh, uh, fraud or or misuse uh, detected the the incentive you do the the philosophy you you told to uh, that you have it to make it very very unattractive to people to uh, or make it or you can say it also in other way uh, that you um, uh, that you more or less force them to provide the correct data and and actually declare what is uh, what they are what they are shipping that's that's also an interesting one, and I think it's something where we also would need to uh, to more to look into into this. We have um, um, colleagues in within DigiTechSuit; they are responsible and they are looking into uh, what would be the opportunities. Uh, how could blockchain facilitate the custom processes, the custom businesses? But to go more in details, that I would need them to cross check with uh, with them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It was a long question, so yeah, I guess yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a long answer. Um, a very, very quick question, because we are running out of time. So. Very quick question. Uh, what can be the role of platforms uh, in, in, in the security check? Can, uh, uh, can they have the role of IEA? Uh, can they have IEA status if they want to do so, if they want to take over? Uh, and, uh, yeah, second question. Uh, <laughs> apologies. Uh, um, uh, what can be the role of a query code? If you have a global query code on each product, uh, the artificial intelligence would have no would have a huge uh, uh, input. Uh, clear, uh, yeah, I, is there a, a perspective that this can be realized? In principle, we are currently building our future platform, which we are going to use to exchange uh, the data, which is called the um, Import Control System Two, and that will be the main platform for customs and customs organizations to exchange data, which is relevant to supply chain security. But it's foreseen that this also that the data which is available there can also be enriched and complementary from from other from other platforms, even also in, in private or commercial platforms. So we are trying to get the best picture, to get the most um, um, uh, complete view and knowledge of goods who are moved and shipped around. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for uh, I will continue with our second speaker. Thank you very much again. So uh, our next uh, guest is uh, uh, Mr. Ahmed Duza. Uh, he comes from Maggioli Group. He's a project manager and a research associate in Maggioli Group. He's specializing in transferring research results into industry, and he's made interest are in the protection of critical infrastructures and the use of secure technologies in different domains. His presentation is entitled Empowering Reliability and Trust in Digital Service Chains. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Thank you, Nineta, for this nice uh, introduction. I, I just want to spend uh, two, a few words for my company. Uh, so Maggioli is a IT, an Italian IT company that provides uh, IT services and uh, solutions to public uh, administration. We are currently uh, operating in Italy and Spain and extending our operation also in Latin America and uh, Southeast of Europe. 
so from uh, the last, uh, let's say, uh, eight years, we are also participating in different European uh, projects and trying to transfer these results, uh, research results, uh, and experiences from these projects uh, in our products and uh, services. So uh, the presentation uh, this morning uh, is about digital service change and uh, the, say, the objective of this presentation is to provide an overview of the digital service chain and try to understand what are some of the challenges that uh, we are uh, facing in, in, this, uh, in this direction and what can be some, uh, some possible recommendation, but also possible solution that we are also targeting in one of the projects that I'm going to explain uh, a bit later in my presentation. So to start with, I want uh, once again to stress uh, uh, the role of the data uh, uh, in, the, in, in the digital economy. Uh, since there are a lot of digital services and products that are going to generate, consume and share uh, a lot of data. And what is also important to mention is that these data, they are not going to, to, to still, let's say, remain within the domain, but they are going uh, to, to go between the different uh, domains. So uh, the, the information, the existing uh, uh, information systems are, are not uh, anymore uh, as, uh, let's say, uh, as suitable for these uh, digital services as it was before. Uh, so we have uh, examples of this ecosystem in, uh, already identified in some of the sectors like energy, manufacturing, logistics, healthcare, and uh, smart cities. Uh, so uh, today, most of the business, uh, let's say, services follow a fully digital workflow. So we have the uh, ideation phase, so the design, we have the implementation, we have the, the purchase, we have the transport, uh, the trading, delivery, and uh, after sales. But what is happening now uh, with these new digital services and uh, products that are uh, emerging like every day in our society? So uh, what they are doing uh, is that the existing IT systems, as I also mentioned before, they are not suitable anymore to follow the market dynamics. So uh, the, the, the digital economy is rewriting the rules and creating new business models for uh, these new services and uh, solutions to be, uh, uh, let's say, in, implement, implemented in different, uh, in different sectors and so allow to, to create, process, share and distribute data and, and, and content. Uh, from a technical perspective, uh, the, the business chain it is defined as a logical interconnection uh, between uh, different processes, software uh, and devices, and feeding them with relevant data across uh, multiple technological and uh, administrative domain. So let's see uh, how uh, let's see an example in order to to try to understand how this uh, works uh, practically. So we have uh, this uh, industrial supply chain with uh, three main uh, sectors. So practically we have the manufacturing, we have the transport, and the assembly. So there are uh, different sectors involved, different sectors that they have to communicate uh, with each other in order to, to process, uh, in order to, to, to complete the, the full uh, system and deliver the, the, the required uh, system to the, to the end user. Uh, but uh, uh, what is happening, so, uh, uh, sorry, uh, then we have also a lot of uh, interconnections uh, between these uh, different sectors because we have like IT, uh, IoT devices, we have uh, different IT system, a cloud uh, or edge computing that they are connecting, they are interrelating to each other. So uh, every one of these interconnections is a potential risk, uh, a security risk for uh, 
for the for the specific domain, but also for the entire chain. Because if one of these uh, uh, IoT devices, for example, of one of the IT systems can be uh, 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 can be attacked by a, a, an external uh, entity, uh, this problems, uh, security issues can be translated within the, the domain, but they can also translate it and transfer to other domains that are uh, interconnected to this specific domain. So uh, this requires uh, a, a total control of the, the, of the entire chain, so uh, of the specific connections, but also the interconnection between the, the different domains and, uh, uh, and the, the data that is, uh, let's say, uh, shared with, uh, within uh, these uh, domains uh, and, uh, and the events. Uh, uh, what are some of the, the future trends uh, in this market? So what uh, the, the future business services are going to, to, to create a, a a, a unprecedented degrees of freedom in their dimension. So as we mentioned before, the infrastructure, the software and the data. And, and they are also going to, uh, to use distributed frameworks and patterns to, fac uh, to facilitate the design, the, the implementation, and the, 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 the management of this system. Uh, convergence among these uh, existing uh, system and software paradigms, like, for example, the cloud computing, the software-defined uh, software networking, and the Internet of Things, uh, will also uh, leverage the autonomicity and dynamic uh, composition of this service-oriented and everything-as-a-service uh, cyber-physical systems. Uh, as uh, a matter of fact, uh, actually today uh, there are a lot of uh, microservices, web services, service-oriented architecture, but also software orchestration paradigms that are already present uh, and they say they are already being developed and uh, integrated uh, somehow in the in the market. So we have, for example, the Fireware initiative that they have already defined and they are providing some uh, open and uh, royalty-free APIs for the development and, uh, and the deployment. But from the other side, the International Data uh, Space Association is providing a, a, a complete architecture for the industrial data spaces. Uh, while by uh, Etsy on the, other uh, on the other side, they have defined a complete architecture for network uh, uh, function virtualization, which will be one of the key, let's say, implementation for the 5G uh, infrastructure that is uh, now, let's say, uh, developing uh, very fast, and there are a lot of uh, attention, but also a lot of development of the, uh, on this direction. Tosca, on the other side, is by default the, the standard, uh, the de facto standard for providing, uh, uh, let's say, uh, IT system for, for, or for cloud application. And uh, last but not least, the, the Chef Digital, which is the, the digital arm of the Connecting uh, Europe facility, is, uh, is investing a lot in uh, providing these digital building blocks, which will uh, facilitate, let's say, the, the implementation and delivery of public services across borders and sectors. And this, uh, let's say, combination of building blocks uh, that covers the whole process of data collection and treatment will be one of the, let's say, key, uh, key fundamentals for the European data value chain. Uh, so going back to the security problems that, as we mentioned briefly before, so the, the growing complexity, the multi-domain characterization of this uh, uh, digital uh, supply chain the outdated security paradigms and the scarce automation of this related process are making the digital services uh, even more vulnerable to security breaches and less trustworthy. So, uh, what what we, we uh, let's say uh, how we can also summarize some other uh, security. Uh, concerns that uh, are, let's say, uh, in addition to that uh, already mentioned during the, the presentation, there are some 
uh, there are actually uh, a, a lot of security concerns that uh, are related to the digital uh, to the digital services. But the three uh, the three main security concerns that I'm going to present now are uh, let's say the the most uh, emerging one that has to be uh, addressed uh, in order to uh, to increase the the level of uh, re uh, let's say of uh, of security and trustworthy in the digital services. So from uh, from this uh, study of uh, <coughs> uh, of Nessie uh, white paper that was uh, delivered in 2017, uh, they have pointed out that uh, actually one of the let's say the the main uh, challenges for for the security of the digital supply chains is still the manual operation. So the involvement of the uh, of the individuals. Uh, uh, of uh, human individuals uh, in the design, in the implementation, configuration, and management of the supply chain. So uh, relying on the individual's ability uh, is not any more practical and is clearly an acceptable practice when it comes to the critical infrastructure and uh, the large supply chains uh, when they are involved. So what we need here is uh, some kind of automation uh, in order to to, fa to facilitate and speed up the let's say uh, the process, uh, and uh, uh, the second one, uh, the second security con uh, concerns or challenges uh, is related to the integrity and the trustworthy of uh, of the chain. Uh, so. Uh, uh, when uh, devices and softwares from different players are actually composed together in a business uh, relationship, uh, the trustworthiness and the reliability of the end-to-end -end services is strictly de dependent on the security in each of the administrative domains. So what, uh, let's say, uh, what is the current identity, uh, what are the, some, let's say, the, uh, the existing solution, the existing identity, uh, identity management and event management uh, solutions for access control or, or access control tools that uh, have, uh, let's say, are being developed and integrated today in the distributed system. Uh, can neither guarantee the integrity, but neither the let's say the the, the bendability of the, the the entire chain. Because as we said before, in the chain we are not seeing uh, the specific uh, domains uh, as as uh, as uh, a separate entity, but they are now part of the, of the supply chain. So. Uh, the integrity and uh, the dependability is a very important factor that has to be considered uh, in order to address these security challenges uh, of the entire supply chain and not anymore in the as it as let's say has been done until uh, now uh, uh, let's say looking only to the security of one specific domain in particular and uh, in order to conclude, let's say this uh, this summary of the some of the security challenges that uh, are addressing, the, let's say the the digital uh, services. Uh, the, the last but not least is uh, the control uh, of the propagation of private and, and sensitive information of the users. So uh, we know that uh, actually tracking this, let's say. Uh, Let's say this data, uh, the user data within the entire chain uh, is, uh, let's say, very uh, difficult and uh, actually very, uh, very hard to, to be traced by the user who cannot easily check whether the, the service owner or the security mechanism that are, let's say, being adopted in order to increase the level of uh, integrity of the security, like the uh, encryption, uh, encryption mechanism, uh, or also the confi uh, confidentiality policies uh, are not compliant with its own requirement, but also with uh, the, the legal and ethical requirements uh, when it comes at national and, uh, uh, and European level. So uh, when the, the private data and sensitive data are shared among this uh, entire supply chain, uh, and so different domains, and not anymore as before, uh, one specific domain, uh, it is, uh, as already mentioned, it is quite impossible to trace and limit their propagation. 
so uh, other challenges that uh, that are facing when, when uh, we say dealing with digital services and uh, specific uh, supply chains uh, related to the uh, to the security chain, uh, we have uh, I have enlisted here some of the challenges that uh, uh, that are the most let's say uh, uh, let's say uh, critical that has to be addressed. So there is the the slow and ineffective detection of attacks due to partial or incoherent security information or also uh, due to non-interoperable uh, algorithm targeting specific cybersecurity uh, attacks, uh, difficulty in identifying new threats and vulnerabilities because of limited information and data available, but also uh, ineffective correlation of data from multiple sources. And uh, another, let's say, uh, related issue is maybe also the lack of big data and machine learning techniques that, uh, that let's say, can be used in order to, to identify new threats or, or zero-day uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, another issue is the outdated and inefficient architecture that are being, let's say, up to now uh, adapted for sharing security tokens, so which are unable to, uh, to combine the need for a fine-grained knowledge with uh, efficient resource usage. Uh, the, the technology and the business lock-ins for the adoption of vertical and uh, tightly integrated network and cybersecurity solution. Uh, okay, then I will move on because uh, Mineta just pushed me to, to go directly to the conclusion. So I will I'll go very fast uh, just to mention that uh, we are now involved uh, in a European project which is called GUARD. Uh, it is uh, funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 uh, program. And uh, let's say the, the main goal of GUARD is to improve the awareness of the digital, uh, of the different layers and, uh, involved in the business processes. So from the users, the IT staff, the management, the, the legal departments, and uh, in order to improve the, the response and mitigation. And so the vision in three words, let's say, is to improve the detection of these attacks and uh, identification of new threats by applying real-time and offline machine learning and artificial intelligence mechanism, uh, leverage the programmability to shape the granularity of contact information uh, to the actual needs, and uh, of course, improve, the, improve uh, the awareness and reaction by developing user tools for uh, visualization, notification, configuration, and uh, mitigation. So uh, what are some other recommendations for future works that, let's say that, uh, uh, as I illustrated before, there are a lot of challenges, security challenges, that has to, let's say, to be addressed when dealing with uh, digital service chains. Some of them, uh, we are trying to, to address them in the, in the Guard project, but uh, of course there are other uh, challenges that, that need more attention uh, from the market, but also from the research and academia uh, community. So there is the need for continuous security assessment of complex and dynamic uh, system topologies. Uh, the adoption of uh, cost-effective and scalable methodologies to engineer security and privacy in new systems and services, and uh, to evolve the autonomous systems into a programmable system, improve the agility of the software development, and, uh, of course, improve the awareness of the users about the, their trustworthiness level. So the users has to be the key drivers uh, together with the data, because the data are strictly related to the users, so the users have to be fully aware of their data, where the data are generating, where the data is coming, and uh, how the, this data is moving from one domain to another domain and to the entire supply chain. So that, that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, for your very nice presentation. So I'll give the floor to the colleagues from Brussels now to start their questions. And then, are there any questions? 
okay. Well, the call is from Luxembourg. No questions, thank you. Okay, that's great because it's giving me the chance to have a question. Okay, so. <laughs> so do you want to? Um, it is very interesting um, uh, about these future business services you mentioned, which uh, using distributed frameworks and pat patterns yeah. to design and manage supply chain. Uh, we always say that we always need uh, new business models in, the, in this digital era. And uh, I'm wondering <coughs> if there are any um, projects or efforts that you are aware of uh, for starting this uh, new way, new future business services, because I think this is, this is a solution actually to distribute uh, the, the, the patterns and the framework yeah, actually, to manage. Uh, while we were preparing GARD, the proposal of GARD, we did uh, an initial market analysis trying to investigate if there are already some existing solution on the market or also some research initiatives in, in this direction, but actually there are no real, let's say, uh, or uh, let's say uh, real initiatives that are addressing uh, these ones, but of course GARD is going to move in this direction. GARD just started last month, but uh, uh, I, I hope that from here to one year or two years timeline, we will have uh, some real results uh, on this direction. And since this is also an innovation action, uh, our goal is not just to provide research or uh, academic, uh, let's say, uh, solution, but also to provide some real uh, business models that can be uh, applicable by different business uh, chains and, and sectors. Uh, so as we mentioned before, healthcare or uh, industry reform point zero and other sectors, of course. Thank you very much. That's very interesting because new challenges require new models and uh, that's a very nice approach. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you very thank you. much. You. Uh, so we will continue with our last speaker. This session is very, very interesting because we had a policy expert, a business expert, and now um, a mathematician, actually, <laughs> that we can see some new models for risk assessment. And our next speaker is um, uh, Stefan uh, uh, Schauer. That uh, he comes from the Austrian Institute of Technology. He's uh, a senior researcher since 2005 in the Austrian Institute of Technology in the fields of risk and security management in the Center for Digital Safety and Security. His research focus uh, lies on risk assessment methodologies and processes, applying uh, various innovative mathematical concepts for the identification and handling of cascading effects within an organization and among critical infrastructure. Stefan's uh, presentation is entitled Cascading Effects in Supply Chains. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you very much, Ninetta, and uh, also Thank you very much for inviting me here to this, uh, to this event, to this audience, to uh, talk a little bit about the things that we are doing currently at uh, AIT in Austria. Um, as Ninetta just mentioned, we heard something about uh, policies in the uh, last talks. We heard something about uh, the threats, the new uh, challenges that supply chains are facing. And I would like to focus a little more on the impact specific incidents can have, the impacts and specifically the cascading effects that those new challenges, the new threats can have within a supply chain. Um, at first, let me just give you a very broad overview on uh, AIT, the company I'm working for. It's uh, the Austrian Institute of Technology. It's uh, the largest research organization in Austria. And we are uh, looking into several different fields of application when it comes to uh, the research issues that we are tackling. Uh, me, myself, uh, I'm working in the Center for Digital Safety and Security, where we are looking at uh, surveillance and uh, protection. We're looking at reliable systems and, of course, also on um, critical cyber infrastructures. And here, as Ninetta just mentioned, I'm looking into risk management, security management methodologies, which can be used to protect critical infrastructures 
uh, on a national basis, but also, of course, to protect supply chains, which themselves uh, represent critical infrastructures, not only for one nation, but uh, also um, across different nations. Um, I wanted to start with a short motivation uh, about the importance of supply chains, but um, thanks to my uh, pre uh, presenters before me, which uh, already gave a very good overview on uh, the difficulties and the challenges in supply chains. I just wanted to stress again that supply chains in uh, the last years have evolved into very complex and highly interdependent uh, cyber-physical ecosystems. So everybody in a supply chain is connected to each other. There are a lot of uh, digital systems that are operated by the different business partners within a uh, critical infrastructure. Armand just gave a very good overview how they are uh, interacting and that due to this increasing digitalization, there are a lot of new threat vectors coming up that give attackers from all over the world the potential to interfere with the supply chain, to hack specific um, business partners within a supply chain and um, cause a lot of damage to uh, the economy and to the infrastructures themselves. Um, one uh, big example, maybe one of the biggest, was uh, the NotPetya ransomware attack in 2017, which was yeah about this time two years ago. In uh, in summer, the the ransomware affected uh, several big companies. For example, uh, the pharmaceutical company Merck, which uh, had suffered a damage of about 870 million euros. There's also the uh, the European branch of FedEx, the TNT Express, which uh, suffered um, at first 300 and then they had to increase. They suffered 400 million after all from uh, the NotPetya ransomware attack. And of course, there was uh, the shipping com company Müller Maersk, um, which also suffered a big loss, um, about 300 million um, euros from this infection with uh, the ransomware not Patya. I don't know if you are all familiar with uh, uh, the ransomware. So it originally or, uh, um, infected a small company in the Ukraine, uh, which was providing an application, a software tool, for uh, the tax businesses and um, um, yet yeah, to all the, the, uh, the companies doing business in the Ukraine. The software got infected, and by by this, the customers of this uh, small companies, and this was basically a large part of all companies doing business in in, in the Ukraine. They also got uh, got infected, and uh, the the companies I just mentioned, amongst others, they were also uh, suffering from this, and the infection then propagated through their own company networks. Now, in the context of Melomersk, for example, um, the effects were very visual to the public. It was not just IT systems affected. Um, the, the ransomware, the effect of the ransomware were just that the system would shut down and would not come up again unless you pay some ransom. And uh, in the context of Mullamersk, the um, operating terminals um, they are having in, in many of the ports all over the world, uh, the systems in those terminals, they shut down and the, the people there could not um, do their day-to-day -day business. So, uh, for example, in India, the second largest uh, container terminal, it was at least the part that Mullamersk operated was completely blocked for a large amount of time because it was not possible to either load or unload ships coming um, in or wanted to go out of the port because none of the systems was available. So this is one of the most illustri uh, illustrative examples how uh, a cyber attack in one small company in the Ukraine can have an effect on uh, a, one of the largest ports in India and um, just halting all of the, the business going in and uh, going out of, uh, of the port. Now, the, the core thing in uh, supply chains, and this is also something that um, has been mentioned in the previous talk by uh, Armand, are the interdependencies 
between the business partners of those supply chains. So here on the right, you can see just a, a very um, um, high-level illustration of the different sectors that those business partners can come from. So we have, uh, uh, we have uh, the government services here, uh, of course, bank financing, communications to a large part, so all the um, IT infrastructure and so on. And there, there are business partners working in those, uh, in those areas, and they're offering their services to other business partners who are also uh, working in the supply chain, and they're depending on those services to operate to provide their own services. So um, this main characteristic of, of uh, an interdependence is what makes the, the, the whole supply chain so vulnerable to uh, a particular attack on one of the business partners. In general, we can distinguish between physical and cyber dependencies, where uh, physical dependencies, uh, you are dependent on a, on a resource of a physical service that is uh, provided by one of your partners, whereas in cyber dependency, you're just uh, dependent on information, data, or a cyber service that is provided by one of your business partners. And um, with the increasing digitalization, of course, the um, the, the, the space, the number of cyber dependencies just grows bigger and bigger. And uh, that's why um, an attack on the cyber side can have such a large um, effect on, um, on a supply chain. As said in the beginning, and as we've heard uh, in uh, the talk of Will and also of Armand, there are new threat vectors, there are new challenges coming up due to these... Um, to these uh, cyber systems that are interconnected. And most of all, there are vulnerabilities that, are, that can be found in every software, in every uh, application, just due to programming errors or, or other faults. And adversaries use those vulnerabilities as their main entry points into a system. So what they do is they uh, exploit the vulnerability to get access to a system, also to increase their uh, the privileges to uh, be able to do more, to get control of a specific system, and also to uh, go on through a corporate network and uh, to get access to more critical other cyber-physical systems, for example. And in this way, an adversary can move from one business partner to another and can uh, propagate through the entire supply chain. The problem here is that if you're an operator of a specific service, if you're one part of the supply chain, you might be very secure, you might be looking after your systems and you're doing everything about um, IT security, what can be done, but there might be another partner up, uh, upstream or downstream the supply chain, which is not doing that um, as sufficiently as, as you do. You're, um, they're having weaknesses in their assets and this could be the entry point for an adversary which makes um, your infrastructure vulnerable uh, to, an to an attack and may cause your infrastructure to uh, break down along the way. Um, this is just a very uh, brief example. I uh, took the example of, um, of a port infrastructure which is coming out of uh, one of our projects. And as you can see, you have um, the port infrastructure which already has several business partners in it. So you have um, a port terminal and you have a port authority uh, you have um, an ocean carrier and an hinterland carrier, which are all located within uh, the area of the port, but they are individual partners and they have individual systems, but they're also connected uh, with all the others to efficiently perform their work um, in the port. Now, if something, uh, if something is happening, like, for example, you have in customs, you have a database which is uh, vulnerable, and some adversary can exploit that, then uh, the port authority can also be um, uh, affected by this vulnerability because uh, the, the adversary can use the network connection to go from customs to uh, the port authority and uh, maybe steal some customer data, have some ransomware affection. This can also affect then, as we've seen in the Mellomersk, either the ocean carrier, the hinterland carrier, the port terminal, just to stop their operations, maybe shut down uh, the cranes so that the whole uh, port 
is not working properly anymore. Um, I just so the question now is what can we do to either identify those cascading effects to see where they uh, um, where they come from and what uh, other systems might be affected by them and the other thing is to how to assess these um, effects and in uh, two H2020 projects that we uh, have been working on, the one is uh, called Mitigate and the other one is called Sauron, we looked into this problem and uh, we came up with two different solutions, uh, which I would like to uh, sketch very briefly in my remaining time, just to give you an overview what could be done in this direction to, um, to look a little bit in more detail on these cascading effects. So in the Mitigate project, we were focusing on the vulnerabilities that the specific software, uh, pieces of software that the, the assets can have. And there, is a, a large, uh, there are large databases out on the public, uh, operated by NIST, the, the National Institute for Standards and Technologies in the US, which provide information about those vulnerabilities. Um, so everybody's aware that they exist. They also uh, provide methodologies, mitigation strategies in those databases to uh, patch those vulnerabilities to make systems more secure. And this information uh, can be used in the risk assessment process. Um, what you could do is something called topological vulnerability analysis, TVA, um, which you can use to find an attack path throughout the system of your assets, the infrastructure that you have, and that also might be uh, lying within your business partners along the supply chain. And uh, TVA can give you an, uh, an hint how an, uh, how an adversary can get from an entry point, which is vulnerable, to a specific target point, maybe at another operator, and um, can highlight you the way through the different uh, assets in this, uh, in this graph. Um, as I said, this, this can also spawn across different uh, business partners in the whole supply chain. And by visualizing this, by um, highlighting those uh, attack paths, we tried to make uh, the operators of the individual systems more, um, more aware of the risks that they are facing. Um, what we try to do is to uh, look at the impacts that uh, the assets along this uh, attack paths can have on their respective um, business partners as well as on the entire supply chain. And we use these uh, risks to uh, come up with an overall risk estimation of uh, the entire supply chain um, for a specific incident happening to one of the systems. So just to look at a very, uh, very simple example, we have uh, um, a supply chain of several business partners here. We have one uh, server that is of, of interest, uh, of interest uh, which lies with uh, business partner two. So there is one uh, desktop operating or um, exchange, exchanging data with the server. Uh, which is within the same business partner, but there are several others that uh, are also using information interacting with this server um, along, the, uh, along the supply chain. And as you can see in the bubbles, um, I just uh, put in a very small set of applications that are running on these, um, on these workstations, on these systems. So these could be, for example, um, uh, a web browser, an operating system like Windows. Uh, it could also be some dedicated software for, um, for shipping management, for transportation management, but also for, for video cameras. Now, what's, what's happening or what, what could happen is that one of the systems at business partner E, uh, business partner one, uh, there is uh, a web browser, the Internet Explorer, for example, which is out on the internet, which has vulnerabilities, and those vulnerabilities can be exploited by uh, an adversary, and the adversary can get access through the uh, Internet Explorer uh, on the operating system where it is running on, so in this case, uh, Windows 10, and uh, by using some, uh, some 
privilege escalation, for example, uh, the adversary can get access of or get control of the entire workstation that you have at, uh, at this business partner here. Now, as a consequence, the adversary can get access to uh, the server here in the middle and also to the, um, to the Windows Server operating system. And now he's able to move forward and also infiltrate uh, the system at Business Partner 6, um, which has also a, a Windows operating system and this Security Eye application, which is a management system for CCTV cameras. So this is the system where the Business Partner 6 uses to uh, get an overview of what's happening in their physical premises. And by uh, following this path, the adversary can get access on the CCTV cameras and can now do something, uh, some really nasty stuff at uh, the Business Partner 6. Although Business Partner 6 maybe never knew that there has been uh, a vulnerability here in uh, the web browser of the first business partner. So this is an example how the cascading effects could look like spanning over several partners going along just the dependencies, the connections that they have uh, with each other. Now in this model, what you would have is very much, very detailed information about the systems running on the specific assets within each business partner. Uh, in another project called Sauron, we used a more abstract approach to describe the propagation of the effects of an incident um, through the infrastructure of, of one business partner or of several business partners. And uh, we are again using a graph representation. So you have uh, nodes, which are the specific assets, and you have interdependencies between them. And instead of looking into the systems running on uh, a server, for example, we just abstractly uh, said, OK, there are different operational conditions that this asset can have. This can range from uh, green to red, indicating full operation, partly compromised, and uh, complete outage of a system. And as you can see here, we are using uh, specific probabilities to indicate uh, a, uh, a change of this operational uh, condition of the operational state. So there are some probabilities that if something happens to uh, the server, it goes from a fully operational state into a compromised state um, or even to a full outage. And we use this, this model to run simulations on an entire infrastructure. So what you just saw here is uh, the inner model describing one of the nodes. And you also have the dependencies between the nodes as you've seen it before. And um, what we can do with this is uh, we can simulate what happens to the overall system, so the uh, entire infrastructure, by just letting one incident happen at one of the uh, in, uh, one of the assets, changing uh, the operational state of the asset, and then seeing how this affects the uh, dependent assets here, for example. And uh, when we go back to our small example, uh, as you see, we don't have any bubbles yet, but we say, okay, there is a uh, compromisation of this workstation here at Business Partner 1. We don't know exactly what's happening, but we know that it uh, has been compromised. And now we want to see how this affects the other assets in, uh, in the supply chain. And due to its uh, interconnection with the, the, the central server that we're looking at, we know that there is a, a good chance that, that uh, the server stop, uh, stops operating, so it goes into a red state, as we've uh, indicated it here. And now this can also affect all the other assets that are connected to the server. So on the one hand, we have um, this asset here, that we, uh, this um, workstation here that we already know, which operates the CCTV cameras of Business Partner 6. But there is also another asset at Business Partner 5, which is running the, um, the transportation management system for, for the freights, for example. Um, this could also be compromised, maybe not going into a red state, but just being in a yellow state. We have uh, a database uh, which is connected to the server via uh, a cloud, which we uh, know nothing about. But due to this infection, we can also say that 
um, this uh, this server, this uh, database gets uh, gets infected, and in the end, uh, we can again see that the CCTV cameras at Business Partner Six are somehow compromised due to the uh, compromisation of one specific asset within Business Partner One. Of course, you can always have some assets that are uh, not affected by a specific incident, but in the end, you get an overview of the, the operational state of all the assets um, of your business partners. And what you could do then is to run a large number of, sim uh, of simulations, thousands of simulations, and you would get a statistical overview on the, the final state of each of the assets, which then can go into a risk assessment to get a good overview on how a specific incident within one of uh, the business partners can affect the whole supply chain. So these are just um, two uh, methodologies, very briefly sketched. Um, when it comes to the way forward, we uh, heard in all three presentations that there are new technologies in the field. From uh, an attacker perspective, the attacks always get more sophisticated to get more um, more complex, and one way to tackle this would be the use of artificial intelligence, so AI-based algorithms like machine learning, where um, the, the computer, the machine, can help you um, identifying some abnormal behavior in your system by just learning what the system would do normally, and then if something happens so that something starts to act differently, um, the system can highlight that and um, in this way say or tell the security operator to be aware that something is not running as usual. So with, uh, with this, it uh, would be possible to identify these uh, subtle attack strategies like um, APTs or something like this to uh, be warned before something, uh, something big, something uh, severe happens. Uh, second thing that we also uh, heard, heard about is um, the application of sensor technologies. So um, the whole IoT sector where you can now get a lot of information from sensors about specific systems in your infrastructure. You can collect those, uh, um, those information, those data, and it can be on the one hand in the, um, used to simulate the behavior of a system, the evolution of a system, and also to forecast how it would react to a specific incident based on this data that you already have. And you could also use this to identify and evaluate mitigation steps, so how to counter specific incidents, specific attacks, um, using such simulations and do it in a more automated way to find optimal strategies against uh, incidents that could happen to your infrastructure or to the entire supply chain. And in the end, of course, um, I put the awareness of the end users here, as we've heard in all the uh, three talks uh, today, that the human factor is the key point in all the um, strategies towards security. So um, the, the, the first, maybe one of the um, best ways to improve your security is to uh, make the user more aware that uh, bad things can happen and what, um, how they can happen, what impacts they can have. Uh, another thing I want to stress is that talking about cascading effects, assessing them is not the whole deal. So um, assessing cascading effects has always to be a part of an integrated risk management approach. We heard this in the first talk by Will that we need structured approaches to, uh, to tackle um, specific risks. We know uh, we have to find processes, define processes that can answer those questions. For example, where, uh, where do we find information about potential threats and vulnerabilities? Uh, which measures can be taken to counter them? And what would be the, the best, the most effective uh, of those measures? And uh, again, I wanted to stress that looking at risks should not stop at your, uh, at your border, at the borders of your uh, company, may they be physical or cyber, but it also, when you're in a supply chain, it also has to go 
beyond your own infrastructure. And in this way, all the partners of uh, supply chain need to collaborate. They need to share information, which is, of course, um, uh, a little tricky and difficult to do. But by sharing information about their systems, um, they create, can create a more secure environment of the entire supply chain. And I wanted to finish with uh, uh, this slide, which sketches the uh, Mitigate Supply Chain Risk Management Approach, which we uh, developed in the Mitigate project. And there we tried to cover all those aspects I just mentioned. So we tried to cover a modeling approach where we uh, focus on the interdependencies between several cyber assets uh, across different partners. We focused on the integration of open data and social media to be aware of upcoming threats, of uh, new threats and the existing vulnerabilities within systems. We um, used this uh, way of looking at cascading effects for uh, all the three steps in the vulnerability analysis, impact analysis, and the risk assessment. And in the end, we are using a game-theoretic driven approach which could give you an optimal mitigation strategy to counter uh, the threats that you, are, uh, that you are facing to make the entire supply chain more secure and not only just one partner. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to, ask, uh, to answer any uh, questions. Thank you. thank you very much, Stefan. That was... So with this last presentation, let us take some uh, more questions for, uh, for Stefan. Uh, from Luxembourg, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, maybe just a, a comment and a half a question. So um, Amazon Web Services uh, uh, has uh, an automated reasoning group that has produced tools uh, such as Zelkova and Tiras that do exactly what you described. So they use formal verification to provide a formal representation of all the virtual machines that they have on their clouds, on the software components that exist on those virtual machines, and on the known vulnerabilities that each such software uh, component has, and how they can interact with one another. So uh, the, the half question is, can you comment on what you perceive to be the differences between your research project and these systems that already are in production at Amazon? Well, um, I think this is a very uh, um, ideal setting at Amazon. So uh, they are very much aware of the threats they are facing. They are very much aware of uh, the systems they are operating and what's running on them. So I'm, I'm pretty sure they're doing an excellent job on, on this. What we are focusing in uh, the research project is, uh, or our companies, critical infrastructures that um, don't have their entire focus dedicated to IT security. They may not be aware of what's running in their systems, what's running in their IT infrastructures. Um, I know that the general uh, thought the general recommend, recommendation is that you should be aware of what's what's running in your IT infrastructure, but from uh, from the field, I know that there are um, large companies um, companies which are critical infrastructures who are not really aware what their critical processes are, and in this case, uh, we we try to find uh, more um, hands-on uh, methodology. Let's put it like this a hands-on methodology to give the operators, the security operators and the, the security stuff at hand that they could use in their day-to-day -day practice to, um, yeah, to, to uh, cover the, the, the challenges they are facing in uh, their day-to-day -day security practice. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions uh, from uh, Luxembourg? Or from Brussels. Okay, well, thank you very much, Stefan. That was thank wonderful. You. So, first of all, I would like to thank all speakers. And uh, let me uh, make some wrap up uh, with all some points I, I wrote down here from those very uh, interesting presentations. 
Um, I guess uh, that uh, we all agree that having risk assessment and performing risk assessment only in our entities is not enough when we are supply chain providers. We need to think about um, identifying and as assessing, assessing the risks of, uh, all, of the whole supply chain, and that requires collaboration among all business partners involved in the provision of the supply chain uh, <coughs> services. Also, uh, we, we, from the last uh, presentation, we saw that uh, we really need, and uh, that these were examples of new models and new approaches of how to forecast attack paths. And uh, by forecasting attack paths, of course, uh, that will, this will help us to become more prepared, to plan better, and to manage better our supply chain uh, risks. We need to identify and measure uh, the cascading and propagation effects of the supply chain uh, risks. And uh, uh, Stefan gave us uh, these two good models from Mitigate and, and Sauron. Also, we saw from uh, Armin that uh, new business models are required and uh, some examples for future business services that deal with the design, integration, and management of, um, of uh, supply chain services and that was uh, very interesting we need to identify uh, as, as Anne uh, mentioned that we need to invest more on uh, identity management and access control tools in distributed systems and then it's further research also to control the propagation of uh, uh, privacy related attacks within the supply chain services and the supply chain attack detections using more dynamic tools and finally, our honor uh, uh, guest from EU Customs, uh, we saw that uh, EU Customs also has three main instruments for securing the not only the EU but the global supply chain, uh, the risk management strategy. So again, risk management is necessary as we saw. The new certification concept like uh, called the authorized economic operators concept. And that's very interesting because in DigiConnect we have the, um, the, the uh, operators of critical services and probably we can think of uh, relating the NIS directive imposing the operators of critical services to perform ris the risk assessment and actually uh, try to align this uh, NIS directive with the certification provided, uh, this uh, the authorized economic operators certification. Also, we heard about the detection technologies that is very, very important, and the smart borders principle that has been adopted. All three speakers have agreed that uh, artificial intelligence machine learning may be a technology that will help the assessing the supply chain uh, risks and help uh, the security of, of data analytics that actually, as we saw, EU customs have a plethora of data that need to, uh, we need to have some new ways to analyze uh, and data uh, this data and probably artificial intelligence uh, machine learning will help us perform dynamically uh, the risk assessment of the supply chains as pro uh, probably the global uh, supply chain awareness uh, of course, human factor is very important. Training, awareness, and collaboration among all partners uh, will be very important for the way forward. Uh, I, if you would like to add some more, please, we'll have some minutes to probably uh, add some points. Okay, well, then it's lunch time. Thank you very much, the speakers. Uh, the participants and all of you that attended the session. Thank you very much and uh, uh, for this participation.